time because we have oh, a yes. packed agenda. <laughs> so um, welcome everyone this evening. This is a very special day for us. It started out uh, with exceptional talk by Daryl and Moyer. And then we did our routine work, which we all do. We came home, I guess, to our families and or to our lives at home. And now we're opening up a really fabulous session and the speakers tonight are riveting and I think they're going to bring perspectives that will charge us with energy to move forward. So uh, I would like to share my screen with you and um, begin our evening. Uh, again, my name is Renita Sharma. I'm the executive vice chair for the Department of Medicine and the residency program director uh, in the department. Um, I'm just going to share my slides. So we're going to start this evening. I think people will come in as they see fit. And I hope they're all here by the time Dr. Hayes starts. Uh, my part uh, is not as important. So um, I'm very grateful uh, to, let me see. Oh. I'm very grateful to the Sodani Family Foundation. This foundation has funded many things in our department and most importantly is funding the Women in Medicine Initiative. The Sodani Family Foundation was founded in 2000. Uh, it has given to many, many charitable uh, projects in India and in the US. The areas of emphasis include medical research, physician education and projects that empower women all over the world. Uh, Mr. Sadani made it his personal mission to give back to society, to bring communities together, to inspire entrepreneurship for the benefit of the greater good of society, and really instill the instinct, instinct of giving, especially amongst our younger generations. He's a former president of a engineering firm in New Jersey. He lives in central New Jersey with his wife, Papu. Uh, Mr. Sadani, I'd like to give him the floor to say a few words. You can unmute yourself, Mr. Sadani. Thank you, Dr. Anita, for your kind introduction. It's my honor to participate in the symposium of women in medicine. We, as a part of the Sadani Foundation, have been discussing with the faculty members of the Department of Medicine at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, the way in which we can provide support in the field of clinical care, education, and research. We decided to sponsor the initiative for women in medicine because it closely aligned with the mission of our foundation. The mission of women in medicine will be to advocate for the recruitment, retention, and advancement of women in the medical profession, just read to increase professional development of all women okay. through support, mentorship, sponsorship, and networking, to enhance leadership training and opportunities to women faculty to educate women on the processes of career development and advancement, to enrich women with resources in topics relevant to women in medicine and science. Under this program, a resident fellow or a faculty member will be recognized for the commitment to advancing women in medicine. This includes plans for new developing programs mentoring female colleagues, creating an educational path, identifying new ways to help women in medicine and advancing new clinical practices focused on female patient care. The nomination and awardees are chosen by Women in Medicine Committee based on the following qualities. Displays a leadership role, professionalism, role of women, role model, uh, model for women in medicine, approval from department chair. It is our honor to recognize the winner with the award 
And so on behalf of the Sodani Family Foundation, I congratulate in advance her for her contributions to the advancement of women through service, science, and support of junior physicians. Thank you all for organizing this program. We appreciate it very much. Thank you very much, Mr. and Mrs. Sodani. We are indebted to you for your commitment to this program. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now announce uh, what we set up for the, in, this is our inaugural Women in Medicine, the Elizabeth Blackwell yeah. Award. Uh, we are introducing it this year. And you know, I often say, as we know, the saying goes behind every successful man or, or individual, there could be a woman. I would say in our department, uh, behind all of us women is a very championing uh, chair of our department, and that's Fred Wondersford. So uh, under his leadership, we established this award to recognize outstanding, outstanding female physician and really to commemorate Dr. Blackwell, who was the first woman to uh, graduate from medical school in the US. And she really died, of, as you can see, that she, is, she did lovely things. Uh, Upstate Medical Center is the new Geneva Medical College in, uh, in Upstate. Uh, she spent her life in midwifery for a period of time and then came back to really give back to medical education. She almost coerced her sister, Emily, to go to medical school, and she did, and she was successful, and they did a lot of wonderful things together. Um, I think today we have 50.5%, that was the latest statistics I could get from the AAMC, of uh, medical school students are women, and, and kudos to uh, her legacy, which started, uh, you know, almost decades and decades ago. So I'm pleased to announce uh, this year's recipient is Shirin Hastings. Uh, Dr. Hastings, Shirin is an assistant professor in the Division of General Internal Medicine. She received her MD from Columbia. Her residency was done at Rochester Strong, and she joined us as an internist in outpatient primary care. And very interestingly, I do remember this conversation with Mike Steinberg, our chief of general medicine, about how it was time for us to get involved in employee health and, and help manage the scenario on the clinical end. And Shirin took that task on. Well, unbeknownst to anybody, COVID came. And Shirin's world was turned upside down. Uh, she learned quickly, she sought guidance, she established policies and procedures. She was 24 seven support. With two little children at home, we all reached out to her. We became her kids. We needed her all day, all the time. And she did all of this. She was only given a trusted APP, uh, Rosalind Julius by her side. And with, with that support, um, she did everything for us and continues to. And I think the faculty and staff felt a sense of safety with Shirin behind all of us. So uh, Shirin, you mean everything to us. You have done so much for us and, and serve as a role model um, for a lot of young faculty and for the rest of us, how you jumped in here, you saw medicine as your calling, you demonstrated that, and you handled uncertainty of the highest degree with so much compassion and empathy even when I'm sure you were under stress and tremendous stress. So we are delighted to present this award. I would like to invite uh, Fred Wandesford, our chair, to say a few words. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> thanks, Renita. Um, well, it's easy to be a chair of this department with so many great leaders. And you're hearing from one of our special leaders, uh, Renita, right now, our executive vice chair. <clears throat> and um, I knew, of course, Sharin, that you were going to get this award, but uh, there is probably nobody uh, more uh, fitting for this award because during COVID, you were like our rock for our department. So uh, this is in part a, a debt of gratitude to you for all that you did, uh, especially with a, with a very skeleton crew in employee health, which grew into uh, COVID testing, uh, what do I do with this? What do I do with that? Um, I want to also say that um, our department is blessed to have many important female leaders in, um, in positions of, in the vice chair positions, as well as in our division chief positions. And, and I'm very happy that 
that we're able to sponsor uh, with uh, the Soldani Foundation this um, award tonight. Uh, I'd also like to say on a personal note that all the important uh, women uh, in my life are in medicine. So um, my spouse of 30 plus years, a partner in academic medicine uh, through all the uh, trials and tribulations and both of my daughters, uh, my uh, older daughter is graduating from neurology residency and for some reason has decided to do a stroke fellowship. I, I don't know why. And, um, and our younger daughter is an MD PhD student. So uh, Sally and I frequently reminisce about, uh, well, at least we didn't turn off our daughters uh, from medicine. And I think that, um, you know, both at work and at home, women in medicine are very important to me. So I'd like to just stop there. Thank you, Fred. Thank you for your support. Uh, you're such an amazing leader and we're grateful to have you. Thank you. I'd like to invite Sharin to say a few words. Thank you so much, Renita and Fred, for your kind words and the Sotani family for making this possible for me. I am so incredibly honored to have been selected from, for this award from such an amazing group of women. Um, I think it's especially humbling to receive an award that's been named after one of the first women in medicine. I often think of the women that came before me. Anytime I have a task in front of me that seems insurmountable, it just really helps to put things into perspective. And I certainly needed a lot of that this year. Um, Elizabeth Blackwell has been quoted as saying, none of us know what we are capable of until we are tested. I would say this past year has been a very long test that none of us wanted to take, um, but I couldn't agree with her more. Um, the women and men, honestly, of this department shouldered the challenges of the COVID pandemic with grace and with strength, um, you know, many of whom were in positions far more difficult than my own. Um, and I was able to witness that through my role in employee health firsthand. Um, I hope that many of you can come away from this experience with a renewed sense of what you are capable of, as I have. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my um, GIM colleagues for all of their support, um, particularly Mike Steinberg. And I'm not saying that only because he's my boss. He's always been a great advocate for me. And um, I, am, I suspect many other women in medicine um, and spent many late nights refusing to leave the building until I did, uh, as well as uh, Rosalind Julius Michael, who you, whom you've already mentioned, who most of you know is the true force behind employee health. Um, so thank you again. This really just does mean the world to me and I really appreciate it. Thank you for everything, Sharin, so deserving. Um, we'd like to move on to the main uh, next part of our program. And um, the vision for launching this came from Fred. We thought about it. And I think there were residents and fellows who really felt strongly about launching. And so we got a little committee with the residents and fellows and they're really spearheading tonight. And so I wanna invite Joanna Rock to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Hayes. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, hi, Dr. Hayes, thank you for joining us. Uh, so our speaker for this first segment, Climbing the Career Ladder, is Dr. Sharon Hayes. She is a cardiologist and a professor of cardiovascular medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. She originally received her bachelor's of science from Northwestern University, where she also attended medical school. She then went on to do her internal medicine residency and cardiovascular fellowship at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine. As a board certified internist and cardiologist, she has worked at the Mayo Clinic for over 25 years in the inpatient and outpatient setting, including being the founder of the Women's Heart Clinic there. She has devoted her career and research focusing on sex and gender-based cardiology, spontaneous coronary arterial dissection, pericardial disease, and health equity amongst underrepresented groups. She's a nationally recognized speaker and educator on diversity, health equity, women's health and cardiovascular issues, and has received many awards on these subjects. She also has created many programs to promote female and minority mentorship, especially as the Mayo Clinic's Director of Diversity and Inclusion. So we are thrilled to have her here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, with that, I'll give you the floor. Stop sharing. 
I think you're muted, Dr. Hayes. And I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I am hoping that you can see a small child. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. So no disclosures, but maybe a little background. Um, my father was a physician um, and uh, I, uh, I, I owe much to him for opening my eyes to being able to do whatever I wanted. I think he wanted boys, he got two girls. And so there was, uh, there certainly was a, a, a um, an atmosphere in my home that, you know, we mowed the lawn and we did everything. It was uh, not particularly gendered in how we grew up. Um, both my sister and I are in healthcare. She's a physical therapist. I really want to acknowledge and thank um, the group here who one invited and organized this as well as Dr. Uh, Mr. Soldani, because it is the recognition that some of the challenges um, for women in medicine and women in society um, need to be addressed. But also I think it is the storytelling that we're gonna hear tonight uh, that sometimes can make it real. So I, I actually didn't as a, a one-year-old know I was gonna be a doctor, but I was digging around in my father who was a medical student at that time. So. I'll start with a little bit about me because I think that's where you can start in this storytelling. So I have a number of identities um, uh, that ebb and flow over time. Some are, are, are constant, right? I'm, I'm a daughter, I'm a mom. And over during the pandemic, just about a year ago, I became a grandmother or a Mimi, um, which uh, brings great joy um, despite uh, the pandemic. But I think that one of the things I have learned is reminding myself of my identities, because I think as we talk about the main, the main show here is academic advancement, is thinking about how women often do things that are less traditional than is the majority, and that often success, whether it is in academic advancement or promotion or life in general, leveraging some of those identities can be really helpful. So remember those identities that are not just doctor. The other thing I'm gonna say is if nothing I have learned over the, the years is trying to align what's important to you. And there's a theme in, in a few of my remarks because there's professional expectations that you have as well as your organization, but you, have your, you come to this with your own personal values your personal and family goals and your passion. And if you can find that sweet spot, you'll be successful in other things. And I will tell you, you will not find that sweet spot consistently over, um, over a, a career or a lifetime, but striving for that. And sometimes when you're struggling is sort of pulling back and trying to align that. So I ended up marrying a doctor. And I think probably many of you, more women are married to either full-time professionals or people in medicine. Um, and so really talking about one of the first challenges, certainly that I, that I found um, as a young physician married to, uh, who was then a cardiologist, and then I became a cardiologist, because we've got to balance the two career priorities, the geography, geography and the fact that we move around for training often, and women are more likely to change their jobs for their partner versus um, back and forth. Um, who's the boss at home, who's the boss at work, um, and career trajectory. So I'm going to talk about women's career trajectory and plant a seed as to why maybe we need to rethink the whole academic advancement. And I'm not thinking you and me or Rutgers and Mayo, I'm talking about the, the entire aspect. Because if you think about how we view academic medicine and promotion, those who have ten, those organizations that have tenure, sometimes it's up and out like after the first seven or eight years that you're on, on staff. So when you should be most academically productive, you also, if you choose to have children, need to be most reproductive. And so um, I was inspired because I, I, I kind of looked at my own career trajectory. These are my publications over years. And I'm just gonna give you a timeline because I'm gonna contrast it with my spouse. So I got married as a second year medicine resident back in 1984. I had my first child in 1990 at the end of my um, cardiology fellowship. I was very unpublished. Um, I had another child in 95. Um, I was a very late bloomer. I, I find some irony in being asked to give this talk about academic advancement um, because I did not become a full professor until 2013. 
Um, my publication rate did go up um, later on. My daughter, who is a psychologist in, in medicine, said, yeah, when I left for college, that was when your career really took off, mom. So contrast that with my husband who like 1984, the year we got married, that was a very good year for him, right? And I think what you will see is he had a very illustrious career, lots of publications. And then actually toward the end, he was a full professor. He was an uber full professor in less than 20 years after finishing um, medical school. And this is our career trajectory. And I think one of the things is recognizing that many women have this acceleration later in career with, they get excited about something that they maybe didn't have time to think about because of children um, and recognizing my challenge when I sort of got the bug to study SCAD and to, to do things is I hadn't kept my finger in the pot as much as I should. So here I was a mid-career physician who was kind of asking the fellows, like, how do I do that electronic IRB. And so what I would say is what we can do for women, particularly mid-career women, is recognize they may lean out and then make sure that our organizations have big flashing welcome signs that says, when you're ready, you come back in and we'll make sure we get you up to speed on doing some of these things. So that's one of the things is that whole career trajectory that may not be unique to women, but is different for many women. The other thing is many women are onlys in their specialty, not as much anymore and certainly not in, in internal medicine, but in cardiology and GI and many other specialties, many women find themselves to be the only person in training or the only person in staff. And women who are onlys or FERS know that they're gonna be judged differently and with greater scrutiny, that sometimes their successes are not acknowledged or judged as one-offs and they can be more likely targets of microaggressions. So these differences can be attributed to her gender, even if they're not, but just because she's the only. And most women in medicine have had some barrier such as these, and some of them are acutely painful, but some of them we don't even see. And so as you move through, learn to recognize those that are systemic in your organizations and those that particularly may be affecting, um, affecting you can help overcome some of those barriers. This is not the point of my talk, but I think acknowledging these, and then for those of you who have the privilege to commit to try to overcome those within your own organizations. So we'll talk about equity. What women want is equity. But I think the other thing is, uh, although I'm gonna talk about what some of you women can do for your careers, we really have to take a step back stop fixing women because women are really doing their part and there are some structures in the system like that career trajectory in academic medicine that can hold us back. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time, but I do think always having that touchstone of what can we do, whether it's leave, whether it's um, criteria for promotion that we need to move forward. So here's not how to fix you, but maybe some things to think about as you ascend into academic leadership. First of all, know that your careers and Rutgers or wherever you are, the metrics and expectations. One of the things that if you are an only or in the minority, whether it's women or a, a race ethnicity minority, they may not be obvious. There's that hidden curriculum and they are important. So if you think it's sort of, somebody has made you think it's sort of optional to um, speak at a CME meeting um, that Rutgers puts on and you don't really have time, but what the hidden curriculum is, if you show up at that meeting and give your talk, that gets you the networking. So learning about what's really important to the organization that you're in and use this knowledge to redefine goals and focus. The other thing is asking for what you need. People can't read your mind. They say that about your spouse, but it's also true about those in leadership. Um, and so if you think you want to do something, I was thinking I might want to go for this um, extra um, uh, training, or I wanted that leadership role, talk about it, tell people. Because those it, women a lot of times don't want to, um, to even open up that box and tell people what they aspire to because they think they'll be pushed down. But I tell you, if no one knows, if you tell everyone, I want to be the chair of the department someday, um, they will help you figure out what you need to do or give you feedback about why it's unlikely, which is also valuable. 
and obviously use your mentors and have a kitchen cabinet of them. So reflect on where you are on your journey. I know that there's a lot of you who are earlier career on this call. Um, I, 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 I may actually be the oldest one on this call, um, but I think one of the things you can do is reflect where you are, try to define that destination. You may not know it and it may change multiple times, but that's kind of where you can do it. If I have um, nothing else, I would say, be open to and embrace serendipity. This is actually a real Uber trip. I was going from the green to the red and I had a lot of in-betweens and I took a screenshot of it because it really was laughable. I could have walked um, a walk there. But one of my strengths I recognize, and again, recognizing your strength is I can recognize and seize opportunity. I'm kind of open to that. And I think it, it speaks to, I founded a women's heart clinic way back in 1998. Um, Heart Truth and Go Red came out in 2004. So I was seeing it in my practice. I said, wow, the, the patients, the female patients I am taking care of are really different. How can we do better for that? Um, my research career, which started in my 50s, which was again, something where I saw something and instead of ignoring it, I said, yeah, gosh, this needs a problem that needs to be solved. Many of those problems, if you solve them can be a, a, a stepping stone to, if not a career a research project or a network of people that you can depend upon. Um, so you can be busy doing your day-to-day -day tasks and you may not recognize that you're stuck. So pause and reflect every once in a while because if you're doing something because everybody says you're supposed to do it um, and you don't care about it, you probably won't do it very well. And if there's something that kind of you wanna try, roll with it, um, try it, but don't let it derail you from the bigger goal. So again, taking those little detours. The other thing is, and this is a hard learned lesson for me, is paying myself first and the mindful no. So when you find yourself completely overwhelmed, and many of us have during this pandemic, is what have you said yes to that doesn't get you anywhere from a career standpoint, doesn't bring you joy, um, doesn't really advance you in any way. And I have found myself at several times in my career where I was getting on a plane, not during COVID, but getting on a plane to give a talk to uh, about a subject I didn't really care about to a group that I didn't even know or care about. And, and that wouldn't be you, I, I will say. But um, when you find that, because it was easier to say yes six months ago to that, remember that every time you say yes, you are saying no to something else. And that may be sleep. So if you really frame the mindful no and get rid of the mindless yeses, it can be very helpful. And sometimes it's a really good way when somebody, maybe even your boss or your department chair, asks you to do something. So you don't say, it's hard to say no to somebody who's superior to you, but you can say, I'm not going to do that now because I am focused on X. So you are saying yes to something else. And that doesn't have to be work. It can be your family. The other thing is having some rules. One of the things from a career trajectory standpoint is this is again, knowing what your metrics are. So at Mayo Clinic Academic Advancement, they really hardly count book chapters in sort of in the academic advancement, original research. And you get tapped, particularly when you're junior to do book chapters, which are a huge time sink. They are hard and long. And so I made a commitment because I'd done a bunch of book chapters and I knew they weren't gonna count. I said, I'm not gonna do any more book chapters because that's not gonna align me. Until Nanette Wenger, who founded the subspecialty of heart disease in women, asked me to do a book chapter for her book. So of course I wanted to be a part of that book. And I took advantage because if I'm gonna do a book chapter, I'm gonna mentor two other people who can help me and also will gain something. So again, you can have some exceptions to those rules. Remember to take care of yourself. This seems like a no-brainer and it's a hard one in COVID, but I am a cardiologist and I would be remiss if I didn't talk about taking care of yourself. You know, sleep, it's the new sex. Um, and I have, I have always prided myself on eating well and exercising and maintaining a normal weight, but gosh, sleep's a bad one for me. So own what your habits are, you know, whatever works for you, which, whether it's connecting with others, which has been particularly challenging during COVID, laugh, abandon perfection at home, by your time. Um, I'm not going to have a show of hands, but think about, do you have a hobby? Okay. You know, I hope you do, but a lot of women in medicine do not anymore, but do you do it? 
Have you put it aside? What might you do to bring it forward? And you may say, what is the connection to academic advancement? Um, being calm and having something that renews you actually helps you do that work. So the other thing I'm gonna say is what you, we all can do. Um, and I think this is particularly important as we lift up others. Um, I have really observed that that old um, stereotype of the queen bee, the women who are pushing other women down, that's just not the case so much anymore. It certainly isn't at Mayo Clinic. And in my connections and networking across is people are pulling people up, but there is a societal cost for women who self-promote, women who talk about their accomplishments. Um, they feel uncomfortable doing it because of societal expectations of not bragging. And they actually get backlash from both men and other women, and they are less liked and less effective. So if you know that, the fact that, gosh, I just gave a big talk at Rutgers, right? You know, I'm going to brag about that tomorrow at, uh, at uh, the, the meeting um, tomorrow, you know, that could come off. So boast about each other. And this is not just interpersonal, but this is lifting up at a department meeting or others say, you know what? Sue over here, she just got invited to do grand rounds at Harvard, you know, or this person just got a paper published because it may not come up. And I can tell you that that woman will not do that. And that is a way for us all to promote and amplify and quote and do this particularly for women of color and people with disabilities and LGBTQ. So this is something that we can really all do. So what else, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up here. So demand transparency, I realize if you're a resident, you really can't do that, but equitable total compensation. We know that there's virtually every study that's been done is women make less than men starting right out of residency. So this is important um, uh, looking to your organization don't diminish your work and your worth. So using terms like, oh, you know, somebody says that was a great job. Oh, it's nothing. I just did this. I was just this. Try to take those things out of your vocabulary. Men don't routinely use those and women disproportionately do. Find and leverage your mentors and sponsors. It's sometimes harder to find. So sometimes look outside your department, um, look for other uh, areas and look for that person or persons who will give you wise criticism. That's the person who knows you, who knows your goals, who has high expectations for you and will tell you when you really got it wrong, right? They're gonna be honest with you. Those people are gold. Be aware of your environment. What are the seats of power? What are your barriers? What are the barriers that are institutional within the department or your own? And know your organization's real metrics, as we said before. Um, my uh, kid's kindergarten teacher always would tell them when they'd come up and say, teacher, teacher, I need some help. She would tell them, use your resources. That is a bit became a mantra for me because it meant you don't just ask, like there may be another kid who can do it or you go look up the, or, or whatever. But there are many resources that are, that may be, whether it's your professional societies. Again, we often saying a mindful yes, even where we're a busy mom to having a role in our professional society what that means is that when it comes time for academic promotion, when you're an associate professor or a full professor, you know some people who are not in your um, organization who can write you a letter. And choose your life and professional partner um, partners wisely. Um, so I was very lucky in that regard. Um, uh, I too have been married to my medical spouse for um, going on uh, 37 years and um, I have, um, and that, it, it may be too late for some of you, I'm sorry, but, um, but I do think that being, finding that respect, whether it's your work partner or your home partner, is one of the critical things for moving forward in academic advancement, as are the many other things that are a part of your life. And I think when we have conversations about women getting ahead and people viewing it as a zero sum game, um, equity for women does not mean less equity for men or anyone else. More women achieving full professor um, enriches us all. It enriches our organizations and individuals. It's not pie. So with that, I say thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hayes. I'm going to ask that questions be put into our chat for answer later uh, 
what a riveting talk and really points to take home and, and implement. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, I'm going to now ask um, Bo Tang. Bo is a PGY2 resident in internal medicine to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Dana Harrigal. Hey, thanks to everyone for coming. Um, it's an honor to introduce Dr. Harrigal. Um, she started off not originally in medicine. She worked for a while as a chemical engineer in the pharmaceutical industry, then decided to pursue an interest in medicine um, and is one of our own. She graduated from medical school here at RWJMS. I believe at that time, everything was under the UMD and J umbrella. Um, stayed on to complete her residency and became one of our chiefs, um, joined us here for a while as a faculty, as well as an PD, um, and led the boot camp uh, clinical course as a course director. Afterwards, she joined Mayo Clinic in 2016. Um, and is still affiliated with them. She is currently the Assistant Professor of Medicine and Director of Clinical Education at the Alex School of Medicine in Florida, where she lives with her family and children. Um, she's been recognized and awarded multiple teaching awards and is very passionate about education. Um, and uh, with that, I will give her the floor. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you so much, Bo. It is so awesome to see everyone here. Thank you so much for joining me when you're trying to put your kids in bed and cook dinner and all of the other activities that happen between 7 and 8.30 at night. So I'm just thrilled to be here and um, I'm going to share my screen with you. Let me see if I can do this. Okay. Awesome. Well, it's it's a little bit difficult to go after Dr. Hayes because she is a rock star and like a celebrity. I got to meet her in person one time and she has a lot of presence. Um, so even though, you know, we're doing this over Zoom, I, I'm sure you appreciated that. Um, I'm going to focus this message a little bit more towards our younger trainees who might be thinking about having a family. And I hope it will also trigger some reflection in um, the faculty who have a little bit more experience as well. So we're going to get started. Um, so actually, when I was thinking about this talk, I was thinking about the title. And I was trying to come up with a little bit of a catchier title or something really unique about work-life balance. And my seven-year-old daughter was sitting with me and trying to help me brainstorm. And she said, Mom, why don't you talk about frogs? They're really interesting. So I'm entitling the talk Frogs because they're interesting. That made me actually think about Frog Lady from The Mandalorian. And that's all quite relevant to the talk today. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, out, we will get to it. We're going to dig into motherhood, being a doctor mom, and having a career you love. So let's get started. I have no disclosures except that I don't have it all figured out. Um, and I love this quotation, wisdom comes from experience, but experience is often a result of a lack of wisdom. Uh, investigational products running on a treadmill is the only thing I'm going to talk about today that might be perceived as investigational. So Today, we're gonna to talk about a cycle you're very familiar with. What I mean by that is the sacrifice reward cycle. If you are a physician or a physician in training, you are very familiar with this concept as it pertains to your career. You put in the hard work, you make sacrifices, and you get rewarded in the form of acquiring a new skill, achieving a high score on an exam, or advancement in your career or training. Now, in high school, college, medical school, residency, fellowship, you've been putting in the work. You've been staying up late at night studying. You've been, um, you know, sacrificing time on the weekends that friends might be going out or you might have a wedding to go to out of state. You've been staying and studying and working hard. And you get the reward, reap the benefits of that um, by achieving, you know, milestones in your career. You also sacrifice for your patients, you stay late to take care of your sick patients who need your help. This cycle has become not just beneficial, but essential to your progression in your career. Nothing can be gained without putting in the work and time. And you know the term we hear all the time in medicine, it's delayed gratification, right? So along the way in your career, something might change. And all of a sudden you're responsible for more than just you. 
Maybe it's an ailing parent. Maybe it's a spouse who also wants your attention. Or maybe you decide to have kids and that sacrifice reward cycle that you fought so hard to perfect gets scribbled all over by a child who just removed their clothes and peed on the floor. But I digress. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about how I was transformed by motherhood in terms of my view of that sacrifice reward cycle and the impact it's had on my career. Let me share with you a quick look at the sequence of events in my career um, and compare that with my sequence of being pregnant, breastfeeding or pumping and having children. So as you can see, I started off with um, having my, uh, was pregnant during my second year of residency, um, had my first daughter, Lila, who's now turning 10 and, um, you know, had some breastfeeding and pumping afterwards. And then during my chief year, I was pregnant with my second child, uh, was breastfeeding and pumping after that. And then over here after I moved to Florida, had my third child. So I'm gonna contrast that with my career goals or achievements. So I'm borrowing a little bit from Dr. Hayes here in her graphic representation of career. Um, so I want you to notice a couple of things on this slide. Number one, my shortest time of breastfeeding and pumping was when I was a new attending. You would think that with being a new attending, you actually get more flexibility, but that was actually a really stressful transition for me. Um, being a new attending, having the responsibility of so many patients all on your own, even with the excellent resources and support that you have, that's a really tough transition. And systemically, institutionally, I think we need to consider this because it's often the time that women are desiring to begin a family and considering getting pregnant and having uh, children. So this is a really, really difficult transition. And I think that that's something that we need to address um, from a larger perspective, like, like we mentioned. I was really fortunate here to have high career satisfaction very early in my career. And that's mostly thanks to the amazing mentors that I had at Robert Wood. I was able to get involved in leadership very early. I was a course director. We created the course from scratch. Um, and I still you know, keep in touch and work on research pro projects and publish papers based on uh, the career opportunities that started right when I um, finished residency in my chief year. But then it dipped down here. And and that is um, an interesting thing that I'm going to talk about a little bit more. But after a little while, it started rebuilding again. And where I am today as a director of clinical education on the Florida campus is a really awesome opportunity. It's such a blessing to be able to have a voice in the future of medical education um, here at Mayo in Florida and reach out to colleagues at Rochester and Arizona, we all work together. It's, it's pretty awesome. So what happened here? I had to make a choice between moving forward in my career or expanding my family because it wasn't really feasible to do both for me, myself and my husband in our careers and the degree of family support that we had at that time. It was a really difficult choice and we sacrificed a lot to start over again, but it was a dream come true to expand our family and I'm very grateful for my little guy who turns three in a few weeks. So being a woman in medicine is not easy. Being a working mom is definitely not easy. But if there's one thing that I want you all in training now to take away from this talk today is that it's possible and beneficial to both your patients and your children to both have a career that you love and be a mom. Becoming a mom suddenly made me have incredible empathy for my patients. I thought about them in a whole new light. I thought of them as they were a mother or a daughter or a father or a son. And I believe I fought a lot harder and advocated more for my patients after I became a mom. It was a whole new level of empathy. I think that having a mom physician teaches kids a lot, particularly the value of being of service to others and doing the right thing even when it's hard. Through amazing mentorship and family support, I've been able to take care of some pretty amazing patients and pursue my goal of transforming medical education. I don't think I could have imagined 10 years ago that one of the most fun things that I do is designing escape rooms that are educational for students, residents, fellows. I'm doing one for oncology fellows as part of a CME course in a couple of months here. Um, all of these things have 
blossomed because of the support that I've had from mentors and opportunities that I've had by choosing different paths. Um, doing meaningful work really makes the other sacrifices worthwhile. So I'd like to offer you some advice that has helped me throughout this journey that I can pass along. And these are some pearls that were very meaningful to me that I think about often. These are directly paraphrased from some elite women you may recognize, some of whom are on the call this evening. So number one, don't wait until the perfect time. I remember a conversation that I had with Dr. Motivalli one night, it was like 8 p.m. at the nurse's station on the cardiology telemetry floor of the old Princeton hospital. That's before we moved to the nice shiny building. And, um, and her advice to me was don't wait. And about roughly nine months later, my first daughter was born. And I think if we hadn't had that conversation, I certainly wouldn't have had my, my firstborn Lila. So don't, um, don't wait until the perfect time. There's never a perfect time. You're always going to feel underprepared. But if this is something you want in your life, I urge you not to wait because you think you're not ready. Number two, Dr. Ferreira, are you here? I don't know if she's here. Um, <laughs> no one, she said this to me and I've always remembered it. No one else is going to take care of that baby, but you referring to during pregnancy. So this means take care of yourself, take care of your body. Your health is a gift and you need to protect that. You also need to be aware of your body if you're working while you're pregnant and prioritize self-care. That includes exercise. The only way I was able to stay sane through each of my pregnancies was through the treadmill. Number three, Dr. Kim, you probably don't remember that you said this to me at one point, but it's always stayed in my brain. So someone's got to clean the lunch boxes. And no matter what, there are some things that moms just got to do, no matter what your career title or level of academic advancement is. So recently I was uh, taking a nap before I was about to go into work for a night shift. And my nine-year-old walked right past her dad, who was working in his office, to wake me up to tell me that the toilet was clogged. So I promptly got up from my nap and went upstairs and took care of business. Um, that being said, you got to give yourself a break sometimes. There are some things that you just don't need to worry about being perfect. Number four, this one is a homage to Dr. Willett. Don't be afraid to ask for what you need or go for something, even if you're not sure you'll get it. Life is too short not to try for things that you really want. You'll be surprised by the people who are willing to help you along the way. And Dr. Willett, you're a great advocate for women in medicine and I've learned so much from you. Number five, this is a large group of women who have shown me that you are capable of a lot more than you think when you put your mind to it. Um, this one is so true. These phenomenal women colleagues have amazing careers and amazing families. And you, you, really, um, you really don't realize what you're capable of um, until you are trying to do everything all at once. <laughs> Number six, and that's Dr. Sharma and Peggy um, who inspired this one. And that's to take care of each other. It is really true that it takes a village and everyone needs kindness and help along the way. We're all in this together learning, providing comfort and healing for the sick, caring for our families. And Dr. Sharma and Peggy are the epitome of kindness and support. I think we would all agree to that. Lastly, I just wanna share with you a few things that have become very clear to me after training in one institution and then moving to another. Number one, I can't emphasize this enough, do good work. That seems so simple, but really listen to your patients, listen to the story that they're telling you. Always go back if you're not sure what's going on, go back to the story that the patient is telling you. Really examine your patients. This is another one that I really emphasize with my learners. Examine, pay attention to their exam. And don't copy and paste. That's not good for anyone. It's not good for CMS. It's just bad, don't do it, please. <laughs> um, number two, find what you love about medicine and pursue it. I realized pretty early on that I was passionate about education and I just appreciate the joy of learning so much and the joy of teaching almost more. Um, but 
go for that. Whatever excites you about a career in medicine, pursue that and really focus. It makes a huge difference when you truly love what you're doing. Number three is seek advocates. And I think this is a common theme. Most people around you are honored and happy to help. I've reached out at different times during my career to specific individuals for a specific mentorship request. And that's really been amazing. And I've formed incredible bonds with people that wouldn't have come through uh, across my path otherwise. Um, so it's really opened doors for me and I highly encourage you to seek out those people actively. Um, the other one is practice essentialism. Again, that is meaning don't waste time on things that are peripheral to your goals. And this is true both at home and at work. This one's a little bit tricky though, because many opportunities will be stepping stones, masquerading as things that you're not super excited about. Regardless, do your best in every responsibility. And if you truly feel that it's not moving you forwards towards your goals, let it go. It's okay not to be doing everything on every committee. I, I made this mistake a little bit early on when I when I came to Mayo and I was invited to a bunch of committees and and not all of them were um, were in line with my goals. But one of them that didn't seem super exciting at first actually led to all of the oper subsequent opportunities that um, that I've had um, since. So um, practice essentialism to an extent, and then. The last one is build those connections. You never know when someone is going to cross your path and will come back around to you again. Um, this is certainly uh, an opportunity in medicine because um, we come into contact with a lot of different individuals from a lot of different institutions. Um, this is also true in terms of the vertical relationship between trainees and attendings and fellows. Um, you never know when someone who is your former trainee, I'm talking about Mike Smarina, who was my first intern the first year I was a, a chief, and now he's um, a leader on several committees down here at, at Mayo in Florida, um, on which I participate. So he's uh, my boss in some respects. And I, I think it's amazing. Like It's a great relationship that we have and, and have had for a long time. So. I want to recap and, and close where we started talking about the sacrifice reward cycle. Being a woman in medicine, you will have to make choices and sacrifices and choose wisely where to spend your time and effort and energy. But I can assure you that choosing to have a family and a career, the reward is a million times more powerful than the sacrifice and it will carry you through those difficult times. And lastly, I wanna say thank you so much and please remember to take care of each other as you all are doing. Thank you so much, Dana. This was a uh, typical Dana uh, from the bottom of our heart. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to now share my screen and I would like to now invite Nitya Hajela. Nitya is a PGY2 resident in our program to introduce our next speaker, our final speaker for the evening, Heather Platt. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to introduce our last speaker here, Dr. Heather Platt. Um, so Dr. Platt actually started out at New Jersey Medical School before joining us over here for her internal medicine residency. And she also served here as a chief. Um, after she completed residency here, she went on to do a fellowship in infectious disease over at Columbia University, and that's really when she started to foster an appreciation for clinical trials. And then after fellowship, um, Dr. Platt actually went on to join Merck. Um, she worked in late stage development for infectious diseases and supported the development of treatment for HCV. And the last five years, she's been working in the vaccines division over there on early and late stage development of pediatric and adult vaccines. And some fun facts, when Dr. Platt is at home, she enjoys spending some time with her family and is working on improving her personal best score for Nintendo Mario Kart. Um, so I'll pass it over to Dr. Platt. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm really working on Mario. Um, I'm, I'm doing my best. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I've kept in touch um, with Renita. And um, when she asked me to join, I was like, Ooh, did you get the right person? Like, huh? But nonetheless, she played along. So um, let me share and let me see if I can get uh, my screen to cooperate. 
I'm so used to WebEx instead of Zoom. Um, so you'll have to pardon me as I uh, share and flip it. There we go. Um, okay, so my talk today um, is about bias. Bias and stereotypes. Now, this can go a lot of different ways. And in thinking about how to, um, how to discuss this, uh, I had to recognize who my audience was. It's a home audience. Um, I see a lot of friendly names and, and seeing friendly faces on the Zoom call tonight. Um, and it makes me just appreciate. I'm actually, um, I'm not completely verklempt, but a little bit because I'm flooded with really, really just incredible memories and um, really all of the situations that come back. So in one way, I see all of the names and I see all the faces that meant so much to me in my training, but that's also woven into the experience that shape the rest of your time in training, where you've come up against challenges, where you've experienced bias directly. You know, as the previous speakers pointed out, Dr. Hayes um, and Dr. Harrigal, um, you know, you find yourself in situations um, that maybe you take on, maybe you took on um, because you thought it was going to get you somewhere that you wanted to be. Um, and also it's a hierarchy. Academic medicine is set up this way. And, and so is corporate <laughs> America. So um, I had, I've had a very interesting experience um, determining the course of what I would talk to you about. All of that being said, um, I found a really great article as a way to frame jumping into bias. Um, Karen Burns um, is pretty published in, in talking about uh, burnout, about um, empowerment, uh, about women in medicine. And, and this was a really nice one that was published in August, 2020 of 10 ways to empower yourself as a woman in science or academic medicine. All right, full disclosure. If you are anything like me, and maybe you are, I see an article title like this and I'm, I'm filled with so many thoughts. First, I'm, I'm just quite frankly angry that I have to empower myself when I think I'm pretty powerful already. And then I become angrier, right? That there's an apparent discrepancy such that I need to pay extra attention to my role so that I can be, be perceived as competent. Then I get angry at myself that I have resentment and I don't wanna read the article because I'm already operating at max capacity. Haven't I read enough for a lifetime? Or maybe I'm just lazy. Maybe I do need to empower myself. Well, I just wasted the time I had to read the freaking article by engaging in a conversation with myself. But I did read the article. So in 10 short minutes, I'm gonna give you the highest level overview and I'm gonna weave in the theme of bias and stereotypes. Here we go. First, be an expert and a leader in your field. Well. Okay, so you're gonna say, of course. Well, if I was the expert, no one would be able to doubt me, right? Because then I'd be the expert. Well, the person who can always doubt you is you. Now that's the bias I think is important to mention. It's sometimes it's the elephant in the room. It's not someone coming up to you and just hating you because they see who you are, what you look like, or you're just in their way, you're taking too long in the coffee line. No, it's the internal bias we have. So. I want to impress the same themes you've been hearing. Recognize your training and your experience. Yes, you are the expert. At, as some would say, you are the attendee attending at some point. Um, but calling out this bias against yourself is the first one you need to recognize if you're going to be able to recognize it in others. Second, find a catalyst, a champion, a facilitator, a sponsor, right? S similar themes that you've been hearing. Now guys, you already have a network. The people in this group can provide different types of support. Maybe for venting, if you're looking at some of your co-residents. Um, maybe for vetting, if you wanna go to a, someone who's a little bit senior, you can bounce an idea off of. Commiserating, well, maybe those people are here. Maybe they're not on this call. Um, supporting, I guarantee you that you have some support here. And promoting, and I'm gonna to get to that in just a little bit. There may not be your champion in this group, but I'm betting you will find one less than six degrees away from somebody that is in this group. Third, act like an equal. Now, 
I, I love movies too, Dana, <laughs> and, and I love Captain Marvel. Um, so the question for you, especially some of the, um, some of the trainings um, and some of the trainees that may feel like, how am I supposed to do that? I'm the, I'm the intern, I'm the junior resident. How do you act like an equal with someone like Dr. Sharma? Well, the answer is respectfully, with purpose and with intention. And, and honestly, when I'm prepping for meetings with, with my senior managers, um, I practice. I script out my main points and I take a breath. <laughs> I frame where I'm coming from so they know what to expect. They're just as busy as I like to think that I am. And if I'm getting their time, I need to make sure I can focus them on what it is I need. Fourth, be part of the conversation, okay? Now, this is not sixth grade where the class is gonna groan if you ask a question because you're holding up getting to recess. But it's also not medical school and you don't wanna be the gunner, right? There's a fine balance. So you don't have to be the first to respond, but you do need to be engaged. You do need to ask some questions. You do need to make some suggestions and you are absolutely able to propose solutions. You, yes, you, and you're doing great. Be in the conversation because you got this. Fifth, role model wisdom, compassion, and integrity. Guys, you're already doing this. You're here, right? There's lots of different ways to say this. There's lots of different examples. And I think we beat ourselves up so much about this one, um, but you're already doing this. So I'm gonna move on from this and just accept we know you're doing this. Um, this has been a really common theme tonight, but preserve yourself emotionally and mentally, right? And I think it's okay to say no, we've heard that. We have prioritized our careers based on the things we think we are supposed to do. Um, and re in reality, you define what you need to do. And I know that's so much easier to say when, um, it, when you're out of training, <laughs> but if you start practicing that now, it's gonna get even easier to do and you'll be actually be able to practice it when um, you do have that bandwidth and you're able to then cement some of those um, solutions. Oh, one of my favorites. Okay, label inappropriate behaviors and comments in real time. I have to say, this was a tough one in residency, tough one in fellowship a whole lot easier now um, because that hierarchy really does influence what you think you can say. So um, we all know that there is true bias, right? The, the, the easy to spot bias, um, but you wanna be prepared for it when it inevitably hits you, when you least want it to, when you haven't slept, when you're on nights, um, when you're trying to get something out of your teeth, right? Because you're trying to get to see your next patient and you have two minutes to go to the bathroom and brush your teeth and put yourself back together to do your job and someone's gonna hit you with it. So we have to have some things in our pocket. Well, here's an example. An esteemed colleague of mine um, relayed this information to me. Um, this person was applying for section chief at an institution and while applying for the job, the person said, your husband has a good job, so it's not like you need the money. Now, this person was coming with grants that would support 75% of their salary. And she was shocked, right? She just smiled and she did not know what to say. And in hindsight, she said, well, I'm really terrible at confrontation. Okay, so that's, that's example number one. Now, the next example, maybe you'll be able to identify with as well. Another esteemed colleague of mine shared this story. She was on a picky rotation as a second year resident. She rounded 6.30 in the morning and she noted that a kid was in respiratory distress. So she, you know, like you all have done and continue to do, jumped into action. She intubated the kid, two large bore IVs, got all of the antibiotics, all of the treatment started. And by the time the attending ar arrived at 7.30, the kid was basically stable. He turned to her and said, you are so much smarter than you look. And you now she's been up all night and um, probably lost a little bit of her filter and said, don't underestimate me. I can run this pick you in my sleep. So we're gonna agree that we have to strike a balance. So I'm gonna give you this bit of homework is that um, this is why you talk to your friends. And this is a great topic to bring up over coffee 
um, or two or some other type of um, beverage, um, you have to think about what you would say. How would you respond? Because you want to be able to say something. You probably want to temper the second example just a little bit. Um, so I encourage you have some comebacks and they don't have to be comebacks. Look, I'm born and, and bred in Jersey. My comeback is rough. I've, I've tempered, I've grown, I've matured, some would say. Um, so you have to, you have to respect that if you want to make the change, you have to respect that where, what you're bringing is one what you're going to get back. So Think about it in advance. Now, I resent that I have to think about some of these things in advance, but this will inevitably, um, the return on investment will be incredibly worth it. Big yield item here by having some things in advance. And perhaps one place to start is to just to say, excuse me, and practice a little bit of that lilt in your voice. But there's a lot of different ways that you can respond to situations that you can have in your pocket and be ready to go so that you're not that you're not gobsmacked, right? And you wanna be able to respond, right? It feels a whole lot better to respond than to be blank. So practical stuff kind of coming at the end of this one. Next one, limit the time and energy that you invest in being angry when you feel marginalized or suffer bias. Um, so, some of those hard interactions stay with us for minutes, hours, days, sometimes years. I think we all have some of um, that emotional memory that will come and bring up your heart rate when you think about some of the scenarios that have happened in your past or recent past. So you have to get to know what your pressure release valves are. Who can you vent to? How do you release this pressure? Do you Peloton? Do you rage donate? Do you eat cupcakes or do you run on the treadmill or any number of those things? I tend to do all of them depending on what has happened to me. You know, pick, pick your battles, pick your pressure release valve. Ninth, be an ally and an agent of change, okay? Now, you've been looking um, inward and reflecting on your own experiences and bias, and we all have bias. But this is the point where you recognize that you have a unique opportunity and being an ally does not mean that you have to be BFFs with everyone. It means that you recognize each individual has a journey, has an experience and their experience is different than your own, but it's never less than, right? And this is where you can amplify, you can support, you can promote. So, um, you know, Dr. Hayes' last message about promoting each other. This is how you're an ally to each other, right? So bringing me to my last point, 10th, embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion, and mentoring across the differences. And practically, and this is my favorite image, I, I really love this one on so many levels, right? For the first reason, um, you don't know what the path was to get them there, right? You That's the part that you don't see. And but they are there now. And I think that's what I really love about this imagery so much. Um, so one practical way to promote inclusion is to listen and to amplify. This works great in meetings. It can work on rounds. So a colleague makes a statement, I can refer back to that colleague by name. I credit them, I validate them. And what I'm trying to do is just to set off a small ripple and maybe somebody else will do that too. And I'm like, oh yeah, lovely, that's a great idea. Or, you know, as, as Sue mentioned, mentioned just a few minutes ago, you know, and that somebody else just agreed with as well because the word we recognize most and we're so attuned to in the English language, pretty much any language is our own name. And you're validating them in front of other people. And that goes a long way um, to, give them confidence so that they maybe then they will engage spontaneously. So you're setting an example, you're crediting people in public um, and, you, and hopefully you're, you're setting up modeling behaviors. Um, so I know many of these things are um, things that are related to academic medicine and, and, and women in science. Um, I, I still, I know I'm in pharma, but I still consider myself in science, right? And, um, and, and there, these things are really true in, in corporate America as well. Um, I'm lucky that I work within clinical research and we, we still adhere to 
more so than I'd like to admit, a very hierarchical academic model of um, promotions development. Um, so everything that's been said tonight is still ringing true for me. Um, you have to know what your metrics are. I'm going to echo that point. I think that's a, a it's just a fabulous point. Know how you're being judged, right? Know how you can compete and help each other along the way. Um, because somebody that maybe you didn't know or you didn't see has helped you. Um, so we just have to keep, we have to keep those ripples going. So with that, I'm gonna close. I'm gonna say again, um, how honored I was to be here um, and how lovely it is to see so many um, familiar names and um, turn it back to you. And hopefully there'll be some wonderful questions so we can continue to engage. Again, I wanna thank um, Heather. I wanna thank all our panelists this evening for an incredible, um, incredible talk about where you came, how you got here and words of wisdom for every one of us. Um, our last several minutes, we are going to save for questions and I'm going to turn it over to Amy Suhatlip. Amy is a PGY2 resident in our program and she's going to um, address the chat box. And I think we should be uh, we could unmute ourselves, Amy, as well, to ask questions. So I think this is a good time. I want to respect everybody's time tonight, our speakers, our panelists here, our attendees. Um, this is precious time tonight. So let's go. Uh, thank you so much to Dr. Hayes, Dr. Harrigal, and Dr. Platt for all of your wonderfully inspiring presentations. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, in the chat box that I can go ahead um, and ask. So Dr. Willett wanted to ask um, uh, to Dr. Platt, do you work with Julie Gerberding at Merck? Um, she has some wonderful stories about being the only woman in the room at the CDC. Oh, Julie, Julie G. Oh yeah, I work with her. Um, no, she's, um, she's a few levels ahead of me, um, but yes, she is at Merck. Um, she is a wonderful voice of reason, um, and she is one of the patient advocates um, and really bridging what people think or know about the industry and, and putting, you know, a, um, a face to that so that, you know, you, there's a point of entry for people to understand the work that we're doing. She also champions one of the programs, Merck for Mothers, um, but um, I was thrilled when she joined um, and am, am always happy when she's able to come to, uh, to speak to us. Um, she's really, uh, she's a great role model and does have fascinating stories. Um, I will attest to that as well. Thank you. Um, another question for Dr. Hayes, um, how did you go about starting the Women's Heart Clinic at Mayo? And do you have any advice for young doctors who are hoping to initiate a similar health initiative? A great question. Um, I, I will tell you that that was one of those serendipity moments. So part of it came from the observation in my practice that there was like there were differences. I was, I had little kids. I did not need another volunteer job because I, my chair at the time was supportive of having this, but wasn't gonna give me any time to do it. So um, I held out actually, that was one thing. So if you're looking for wanting to do this, unless you have a lot of discretionary time, don't take on a volunteer role, even if it's something I'm passionate about because there's a risk of failure. Um, I did look at it as one, um, look for ways that you may, uh, rather than starting something brand new, look for something that will fit in your organization. So we already had subspecialty clinics. We had a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinic. We had a valve clinic. So I, I tried to model it a bit, even though it wasn't disease specific, uh, you know, it was gender specific, overcoming institutional and interpersonal barriers. So I had colleagues who were just incredibly relieved, male colleagues, because that was mainly who my colleagues are and were, who were just relieved. Oh my gosh, Sharon's gonna see all the women. I don't have to deal with all those things I don't understand. But others actually, which I didn't realize said, does this mean that there's some implication that I don't take good care of women, right? So knowing your environment and, and being able to address all of those things. So having the resources um, uh, and, and floating the ideas. I mean, one of the things that 
um, that probably was the best is my chair at the time wanted it to happen, even though I was willing to be a part of it, but not necessarily lead it. Um, it was a way for us to have uh, to, to provide a resource for our department. Uh, we were a division then, but a uh, department because there was just the, the start of sex and gender medicine that was enough to say, you know what? Treadmill tests don't work in women. Or, you know, gosh, we're giving, we're giving digoxin to women and they're having toxicity um, and men aren't. So there was this nidus of, there was a scientific need um, I, I think getting important people to support it. Um, and, and, and I advise people, I mean, uh, Dana will know um, right now there's a women's heart clinic and actually a SCAD clinic that they're trying to get off the ground in Arizona. And when I advise folks within my organization or outside, I give the same advice. Um, I lucked out that it, see, I was on the very front end of a pretty big wave that has allowed us, um, it, we have rotating leadership here at Mayo. Um, even our, our CEO is eight years and our, our, our clinic uh, are like eight years. And I went a little longer, but it came time for me to step away. And I was really, wor I, I worried. I said, if the only reason this clinic stays is because of my determination, that will be a failure. Um, and so we're on our third director right now. So I'm no longer director. I founded it. And so I think setting it up and engaging people, including men, I asked a bunch of men if they'd see the patients um, because they had expertise that was uh, that brought to bear. Thank you so much. Um, another question for Dr. Platt is, can you describe your role in industry and do you have any advice for young doctors who are considering a future in industry? And also um, how did you make the decision to move away from clinical medicine? Oof. That was like a triple <laughs> parter. Okay, um, so I never thought that I was gonna be working in industry. Um, I had never had, never taken a pen, no free lunch, none of it. I was on the clinician educator track. Um, I was awarded from New Jersey Medical School, what they call the golden apple, you know, for being um, so into education. I was chief resident for goodness sakes. Um, all of that stuff that made me just want to, to do clinician education. Um, I loved ID and I said, well, I can still do all of my cool clinician education stuff with, with ID because they were the best teachers anyway, no offense. Um, but um, when I got into, and so this weaves in, I mean, this is like so related to everything that, you know, everybody's been talking about tonight. Um, in my end of sort of the end of my chief year, I got pregnant. Um, I had to call my fellowship and I was, um, I guess like, I don't know, six months pregnant. I started fellowship when I was six months pregnant. I was, I was that fellow, right? Where I was like, hey guys, thanks for the schedule. Now we have to change it. And they were like, oh, you know, my two, and there's three fellows in a year. And then one fellow's a dude and he looked at me and he was like, oh, nice to meet you too. And you know what that means. <laughs> um, so anyway, and then, um, long story, I'm trying to truncate it. Um, but then I had the second baby during my second year of fellowship. So I was really that fellow. Um, so two babies in two years. Um, but the great part was, was that I was looking for um, um, electives when I to fill in some of those gaps, because, you know, luckily, I was able to take my four to six weeks off after the baby, which was like, yay for me. Um, but I was looking for opportunities. And one opportunity was to work in hepatitis C at the VA in the Bronx. And I loved it. I love, well, I, who doesn't love the VA, right? I love those patients. They're amazing. But what I did see was that somebody was getting treated in a clinical trial for hepatitis C. And this was one of those patients that was in an intensive PK group. So they were having blood draws like every two hours. And when it, what you could see was you could see the hepatitis C virus declining and you could see it go to zero. And I just like, this is like the coolest thing I've seen and I wanna keep seeing this. How can I do this? Well, the reality was I couldn't do it if I kept on my clinician educator track, right? The reality was for ID when I got out was that you could do research and you can do it academically. And why don't you have your grants already lined up? The other part was, oh, well, if you want to work in ID, you could go and you can see, you know, 40 patients a day and, you know, make a good living. Um, but I couldn't find that balance of doing both. So I had to make that tough choice. And I was even looking for jobs. And I'm like, nothing's kind of fitting. Why isn't anything fitting? They didn't tell me nothing was going to fit. And I was panicking. I had two small babies at home um, and no sleep. 
And I, I went to my, my fellowship person and I was like, I don't know what to do. I think we need to widen the net. I want to need, I need to widen the net because I'm not finding what I'm looking for. And she was like, oh, well, this passed across my desk. And it was a recruiter, like a headhunter. And it was like, oh, come work for an industry. And I was like, I don't, I just need to, I need to make sure I'm turning over every stone. And I, um, that was Merck. And I joined um, and I was like, okay, well, this looks good for now. I'll get to do one of the things I like. And sometimes making that trade-off um, is, is what you get. And that was the decision I made, turned out to be a great fit, right? Besides the fact that I was really conflicted with an identity crisis when I got there of like, am I still a doctor? I don't know, Do I, they don't call me doctor anymore. I worked so hard and now nobody's calling me doctor. Um, um, I got over it, right? I'm, I'm Heather, it's, it's okay. <laughs> um, but the fit was great. I get to work with super smart people. Um, I get to design clinical trials. I mean, it's super fun. Um, and I still get to be engaged um, and, and I still get to see patient data. So for all of those reasons, those are the things I cling to that make me happy because that's still medicine to me. That's still science for me. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to lie. It was really tough along the way when I wasn't finding what I was looking for. Um, and I had to make some tough choices and really examine who I was and what was going to be important to me. I made it sound really great, but it was hard. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I have a question for Dr. Harrigal. Um, how did you carve a place to create your escape room curriculum? And did you face any pushback with that? Um, and also, do you have any advice for our program to do something like that as well? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having an interest in my escape room. So my whole philosophy is learning has to be fun and exciting or else people will forget. So it needs to be active, engaging. You know, you have to use your brain actively. So I found, so actually as a part of a team building activity at work, Mike Maniachi, um, brought us all to a, a real escape room. And I was like, this is the best. I, I saw how it worked in real life, you know, with team building and problem solving. And I was like, this totally fits in medicine. You actually don't know the problems that you're solving at first. You have to frame the problems and then you have to go find solutions. And maybe you don't have all the answers, but someone else on your team does. So it was a totally perfect fit um, to use as an educational tool. So I did my first escape room a number of years ago with some rudimentary tools. I uh, created an ultrasound um, uh, uh, gel that had numbers in it that they could ultrasound. So they had to practice their ultrasound skills and we put it on a, a simulated mannequin, you know, and so they, that was the final clue that they unlocked before they opened the, the last thing. So anyway, it's been really fun. And so I got a bunch of people to, to, I put in a, in kind of an insane amount of time and effort, but it's been so enjoyable for me um, that it's something that I really love doing. And now, like I kind of work my kids into, it. I'm like, what do you guys think of this puzzle? Like, let's try this puzzle and do this. So, you know, you kind of bring them into your world a little bit when you engage with your family as well. Um, in terms of fitting it into a curriculum, fortunately, I've, I've had an amazing program director, Dr. Michelle Lewis, who has been supportive of doing this for our residents um, from time to time. We've had different themes um, and then for the students as well. So I think you have to put in some effort and energy on your own first. It's not like, oh, I have an idea. So give me some time to like figure out this idea. It's like you got to go do it and then say, hey, I've got this great thing that I made can I have some time to try it out? And then people will see the value in that. And that kind of it has expanded from there. So thank you for asking about the escape room. I'm happy to share any material, any and all materials with anyone who would like to try. Dana actually sent me her latest on aerospace medicine elective. Phenomenal. I'm going to bring it up at our Thursday meeting. Oh, that's they're very exciting. Okay. Um, a question for all of the uh, speakers is, um, looking back at your career, is there anything you feel you wish you had done differently that you think would be a good lesson uh, for the residents or physicians early in our careers? I'll start because I think, um, although I'm very proud of being a late bloomer in, academically, um, I thought I would retire as an associate professor and thought that would be a gift. 
Um, what I did do, what I did do, and I do advise regularly younger women, I leaned too far out. Like I was busy. I had two little kids. I had, uh, you know, both my husband and I were cardiologists. It was too easy to just embrace patient care. And, and I literally did not keep my finger in, in the uh, stirring in the pot. And what I tell young physicians who are in academia is no. We do not expect during that time that you're going to have three or four first author or last author papers a year, but have two or three, maybe just one middle author one so people know and you stay in the mix. So I would do something different. I wouldn't have sort of, at least from the research, I was very involved in clinical practice and obviously education and administration, but that didn't get you academic advancement. And so for if you want that, I think realizing, yeah, the, the reality is you got to lean out, but don't take a step out of the park. I'll, I'll go next. I, um, I, you know, I think that there are, um, you know, you can look back and sort of say what were the inflection points of your decisions and what, what would have happened if it would have gone differently. I don't think those are the ones that I turn to when I think about where my course could have gone. Um, what I do think about in what I would have done differently, and, and I think it's echoing your point, is I, I would have been more engaged on those things I loved and not held back. And I would have been more honest um, in my, um, my true sense of why I wanted to do something the things that I cared about. I think it's that whole thing of saying like, if you show you care, someone's going to take it away from you, you know, uh, or someone's going to be like, you can't do that, you know? Um, so I think I would have been more transparent with um, the people I trust, but also others of saying, yeah, I want to do this. I can do this. You know, that, that toddler overconfidence, right. And harnessing that a, just a little bit more and, and, and not caring of what was going to get me farther, just being in being in those things that sort of, you know, feed your soul a little bit. I have one small comment to add that I'm still struggling with is not to feel guilty when you're at work, when you're at home, like when I'm at home, I'm like, oh, I should be doing something more, you know, for work. When I'm at work, I'm like, oh, I need to be home. So I think being present in the moment is something I'm still working on. It's a work in progress, but that is something that it, there's no usefulness in feeling that way right? We have to identify I'm present and I'm doing this and it is, it is good, right? That's a great question. Thank you, everybody. Um, we have two more questions. Um, one is any advice for trainees who are unsure of what they want specifically out of medicine, for instance, a fellowship versus hospitalist uh, versus being primary care after residency? Um, can I, can I comment? Okay. So I got this advice actually out of college. A uh, professor said, go do something where you try a lot of different things and then come back to school. Um, so one suggestion is maybe if you're not sure, go try something and knowing that it might be a temporary position for you. Um, so one of our hospitalists went and tried locums for a little while. And then she realized I really like academics and I want to come back to academics. So that's one option for trying to find your place is try something and give it a shot and see what fits. I completely agree because I think the urgency, sometimes we feel external and internal to make a decision and not change. I think um, it, that's a fallacy, right? You can try something, you can be an employed physician and decide to go back. The, the one beautiful thing about having an MD behind your name is you are trained for so many different things. And sometimes we don't recognize that. Um, the other thing, just when I was trying to decide on a subspecialty as a medicine resident, um, I liked everything. And so it was really hard. So I, I actually came about, I, one of the rooms I said, what is the bread and butter of that specialty? Because you gotta like that, or at least want to see those patients. And that eliminated several specialties actually for me. So um, I hated melanin. I could not be a gastroenterologist. So, you know, sometimes the process of um, elimination can help you if you really are somebody who kind of likes everything. 
I agree with that completely, right? I mean, th there are there are going to be things about every specialty or every setting that you know that it comes with the territory, right? Um, you know, some people may say, okay, well, you know, I don't want to publish or I don't want to do this, but I still want to work in academics, or you know, I, I want to be in private practice, but you know, I, I don't want to work at three different hospitals. It, it, there's a lot of different trade-offs you're going to have to make. Um, so find the ones you mind the least, right? And that's very similar to, um, you know, lots of, I'll, I'll spare you bad analogies. I've done enough for tonight. <laughs> but but it, it's really so, <laughs> right? Find the stuff that you can tolerate that you mind the least. And I agree, Melon is just, it's up there. <laughs> Gross, not that one. <laughs> um, but also, you know, there are lots of different people that join different fields for different reasons. So, you know, we're not talking about the stereo stereotypical person that is now representative of a subspecialty, right? So don't let that deter you either. Thank you uh, very much, everybody. Uh, one last question, unless somebody else has something to add. Um, this is to Dr. Platt. Would you recommend getting an MPH in biostats before embarking on a career in pharma? So I'm gonna echo what Dr. Hayes just said. You, you have this MD and you forget how much that will open doors for you in not just pharma, not just industry, but almost every industry. <laughs> um, so if you like public health, that's your thing that makes you happy, study it, right? Go for it. Do it because you love it. But you don't need the MPH to get ahead in industry, right? Um, you got to do that. You got to take that on because you think that, you know, you, you just really love it. Um, maybe it would have helped me a little bit. Um, maybe I could speak the same language as some other members of my team sometimes and not have to be like, what's that acronym? Um, you know, biostats, yeah, I slow down my statisticians all the time. And I'm like, okay, so are you really saying that the MITT is like the MFAS? You know, and I speak their language now, but that, you know, you're going to encounter that wherever you go. Everybody speaks a little bit of a different language. So yes, if you think that you're going for industry and you think that you have a, a hole to fill that you really don't understand, that you feel like this has always been a sore spot for me and you really want to build your confidence, that would be one reason to do it. Um, but not just to be able to walk in the door. You know, your MD is doing that for you and it's doing more than that for you, quite honestly. So um, I'm happy also, um, Dr. Sharma can certainly um, share my email if anybody wants to follow up with more questions on industry. I'm happy to talk about it more and talk about my experience um, and share anything else that you'd like, favorite cupcakes, favorite spin ride, wine, whatever you like. Um, thank All right, you. well, thank you so much. And um, I will hand the floor back over to Dr. Sharma. Thank you so much to our resident and fellow host tonight. Uh, most grateful for your engagement in this. And very importantly to our speaker panel, uh, you've just opened our eyes and, and mind to so many new passions and how to really try to carve out a path ahead. So I wanna thank you for your time and I wanna thank the Sodani Foundation and congratulate Dr. Hastings. Thank you everyone. Good night and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great night. So yes. nice to see you. Same here. Thanks, Renita. Thank you. Congrats. Congrats. It was great. Thank that you. was really nice, Renita. Thank you for doing it and for including so many people. That was really special to see some of your some of my faves back. So it was good to see Dana and uh, Heather come back and talk to us. Oh, it's so nice to see you. Thank you, Dr. Renita. <laughs> Sharma for organizing the whole thing nicely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sodani. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. We will carry on this conversation tomorrow morning. <laughs> Good night. Thanks. Good night. Yeah.